Let's Good go. everyone. I'm here with Tyler from Apex Strength. Tyler is the head coach of Apex and who are competing at this year's TSF Team Champs. Tyler, how are you? Well, I'm good, mate. Very good, um, very good. Happy to be here and excited for this meet. Yeah, I'm glad to be talking with you as well. We, it's, it's funny, I was talking to Billy uh, during the week uh, about how much I'm actually enjoying doing these interviews because it's actually rare that I get to sit down and chat to you in, you know, in, a, in a context where we can chat for half an hour free-flowing. It's usually kind of in between attempts at a meet and, and you know, while we're busy doing other stuff. So I'm really looking forward to this, to this chat. Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, the only times we ever get to talk is at competitions when we're probably coaching five to ten people or running the meet itself. Uh, so it gets a bit difficult, and you, you don't want to be rude as well. But you know, we have responsibilities to uh, get to get done. So yeah, yeah, of course, it is so, nice. No, it should, be, should be fun. So um, Apex are back at the Team Champs. They missed twenty twenty three. Were there at two thousand nineteen? Uh, how? Just remind me again. Actually, how old is Apex? How long has Apex been around? Uh, so we started, or myself and Anthony back in the day, started in 2018. So we decided to open a gym um, and we both were kind of like the head coaches um, and also ran the facility. Um, 2018, we're in a location in Merlis in Coburg. Um, some people who have been in powerlifting for a while would probably remember where uh, we were originally. And then we moved in 2020, uh, terrible timing. I signed a new lease uh, about two months before COVID hit. <laughs> expanded about five times the size um and then obviously we had to shut down so that was a bit of a disaster um we you know put a few methods in place like lease all our equipment out um we had a lot of uh, very dedicated members who you know as long as they kept their wages they kept um, paying membership um and basically we survived through covid um you know me and jp were just talking about um, a few clubs that closed down and it was um, quite shattering um you know when they, we lost a few clubs there um because yeah we all want to bring each other up and it sucks uh, when that happens but we came out the other side <clears throat> um and now we're bigger than ever um it's you know it's almost getting too big and there's a point where it's like out of you know it's more than just me or and even when anthony was there for example uh, it was more than just me and him and, and that's why i decided to continue um once anthony left um the gym last year um because i realized it was bigger than me and i was like i just got to facilitate uh the the community in the club in the right direction um and it will keep going and it's yeah it's grown again um so it's really exciting for the future yeah awesome i mean like you know one thing that you, you kind of touched on before we even hit record we were talking about some of the clubs that couldn't you know couldn't get through the the pandemic and had to shut down and for whatever other reasons as well sometimes it's not pandemic related but sure. business is hard man gyms are hard and like you know even just staying afloat for a lot of people can be very challenging so it's good to have a club a club in melbourne that's you know kicking goals it's been around for over five years i think 2018 was actually the first year that we ran the team champs so we went 2018 2019 and then a gap because of COVID, 2023 and yeah now we're into 2024 and we're about to run the fourth edition you guys were there in 2000 and and 19. Uh, 19, like I said. Uh, was there a particular reason that you missed last year? I don't remember uh, what that was. I wasn't the main director. That was uh, I, honestly, it's probably just a post-COVID thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just wasn't prepared for it in that sense. Like um, I was focusing on so many other things, business aspects um, and coaching aspects. Um, I think I was going through a lot of stuff with personal things. Obviously, I mentioned before we started recording this, um, when my house, well, we, my builder went to liquidation and there was a lot of, our personal problems in that sense as well um and just making sure we're, we're keeping goals towards the business um was our focus rather than um you know putting in an elite team together um but now that i've got the time i've also got the arsenal in the sense of the members um and the the community to put together a, a team for this event um and i've yeah i'm shattered i missed last year and and i it almost like we had that conversation um on gmail or email anyway where we were talking about I actually forgot that you even hosted that one um, because obviously I thought I did the most recent one, which was 2019 before that one. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, when in 2019, touching base on that, um, I was sort of like an assistant coach back then. Um, and yeah, we had a team. We had a pretty good team in too and um, we were doing okay, but I think we uh, had a DQ that cost us in the end. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that was a really fun event and it was a lot, obviously a lot smaller 
Um, it was much less competitive now. Most teams, if they had, if they bought the team they had now and put it in that competition, they would win. Um, where now it's super competitive, um, even comparison to last year's results. And I have done my homework <laughs> and had a look. And, um, you know, the teams that are coming in now would be very, would be arguably top three, um, yeah, especially on that Sunday. Um, so it's going to be a really competitive and a great day. Yeah, it's it's um it's interesting how quickly like not quickly I would say but you know the the reputation of the comp has grown actually over the last few years and and I mean this year is, represents the biggest jump that the comp has made in terms of growth obviously going from a single day event to two days last year thirteen teams this year twenty two teams so yeah the competitive nature of it's going to be insane and I'm looking forward to kind of previewing some of the lifters that you've got speaking of which can you introduce who have you got representing uh, Apex at this year's uh, team champs. Yep, so first and foremost, um, everyone would be or know Tony Reinmuth. Um, you know, he's done nearly 30 competitions now. I've been coaching him for four or five years on and off. Um, he's got an interesting method of getting strong. He likes to take his big breaks, um, but he's an absolute freak. Um, and, he, you know, I'm a little bit shattered that he doesn't have more competition uh, at this competition, actually, because... Um, yeah, it's one of those that he would thrive, you know, with a bit more competition. Uh, secondly, we have uh, Lotta Leonberger, who uh, is actually brand new for me to be coaching. Um, she actually just came over from Ireland. So not many people are going to know Lotta. Mm-hmm. Um, so brand new. Uh, Alex has probably done his research a little bit um, that we were just talking about before. Uh, she recently has competed... I think she's done about 20 competitions. She's done IPF competitions as well. Um, a lot of nationals, um, invitationals. Um, so she's a, she's an absolute weapon. And then we have Asha Jones, who no one would probably know. He's a, a country boy out from Echuca. He drives to Apex once a week, pretty much. Um, so very, very dedicated, very dedicated athlete. Um, and he's got, this is going to be his actual first competition. So yeah. Oh. Yeah, and you know what? Um, I have no no because like for most people, I'd be worried because <laughs> I'd be like, "Oh, that's a lot of pressure for a first comp." But he's one of those guys who thrives under pressure. Um, so I'm excited to see him in his first competition. And you know, to, to give you an idea, is he should really hit 700 total with his second attempt. So he's a strong boy for his his first competitions. Um, they they grow up different in the country, don't they? Uh, and then lastly, we have Gabriel Latouf, who has done about three competitions. Um, I actually don't program numbers for him, um, but I have handled him at two of his three competitions. And he's actually more of a training partner to me. Um, and it just recently, he totaled 692 and dead up to 300. Um, and he's yeah definitely up there with a, like 430, um, uh, was it the IPF points? Yeah. So that's the the team. Awesome. It's, it looks like you, yeah, you guys have a really strong team there. And um, man, really interesting to have a lifter coming in, doing their first meet. Before it almost be. Not, oh, go on, go on. Yeah, it's, uh, I guess I compare it to like, I mean, Richmond did this um, in the grand final a few years ago, but they put a, a player in that um, hadn't played a game of AFL and they put him in in the grand final. Um, it was a you know, huge success for them. So it, it can work. It has to be the right person. Um, and, you know, that's the goal from the coaches, right? Like, and I'm sure that in some point in the future, this will happen again uh, where a coach will bring in an athlete who's not a, that experienced. Um, he has done like a, a novice competition. So I shouldn't say he has no experience at all. So he has done a novice competition before. Um, but yeah, obviously we don't, I don't really consider it a, a proper competition until it's on paper and it's recorded. Um, but yeah, this will be his first official competition. Uh, I will say he was prepping um, for USAPL Nationals last year, as his last year as junior, and he dislocated his shoulder um, parking a dirt bike. Um, so obviously that – and that's the other thing. He's got this adversity um, that he's overcome. He's low bus squatting again now. He lost – completely all his range of motion um, and his stability in his shoulder. Um, so he's come back from that and just to show his dedication as well. Um, he's come back from that 
very fast. Uh, and then now he's back benching 180 um, and squatting, you know, 250 low bar comfortably. Um, yeah, so it's really awesome to see. Excellent, dude. I mean, it looks like you guys have got a really strong team there. Um, yeah, you guys have got a really strong team, and yeah, we're super pumped to have it. Obviously, Tony Reinmuth, uh, remind me, in the 140 kilo plus category. Uh, sure. Asher, you're talking about, is uh, in his debut, I think he's in the 110 category. And remind Correct. me, what weight classes the other two are in, Gabe and... Um, so, well, first, firstly, uh, Lotta, um, which Lotta. is obviously... Yeah, and she's in the 67.5, which is arguably the most competitive um, weight class, particularly in the, the female female class it's um the most competitive and probably one of the most competitive in terms of what people are excited for um what people are talking about um there's what 13 uh athletes um there's a fair few ladies from just the recent usapl nationals in there um there's going to be a few people totaling around 400 um you know and lotta is up there um and obviously uh, i mean you mentioned before that alex did his homework and was saying that we might be a contender for um, the Sunday event. Um, And it's probably because he realizes that Lotta is uh, a very experienced, a high level athlete who totals around that 430 mark um, in sleeves. So yeah, so Lotta's super strong, uh, absolute weapon. um, And it was just absolute timing that she joined Apex. uh, And I was like, because I actually had the three other guys like almost instantly, I, I asked them all and they were all like, awesome this sounds great i'm super excited and then i was kind of struggling with that fourth sort of uh contender for the team champs and then lotta joined the gym asked about coaching and i was like well i have a proposition for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah so and that and that's that's lotta and you know this is a great way for her to enter the stage in in australia because she is staying um and she's probably planning on doing usapl nationals later this year uh, and then lastly, we have Gabriel. Uh, like I said, he's like a training partner to me. Um, I've helped him in the past with some niggles and problems. And then he keeps me honest with, you know, numbers and executions. And we, we do a lot of heavy lifts together. Um, and so, yeah, and as I mentioned uh, before, he's, or I haven't mentioned this actually, he's in the 100 class, which is also probably the most competitive class outside the 82.5s. Um, and Probably one that I'm super excited to see is the 100 class battle out. Um, I've seen other coaches talk about that in the sense that um, they're curious how the 100 class is going to go. I think you've mentioned that a lot of positions will be uh, decided by the 67s and 100 kilo class. Um, Yeah, so that's going to be exciting. Yeah, I mean... Clearly, the deeper the class is, the more competitive it's going to be. And and in those classes, like the the talent that's in there, it's just going to be so hard to predict where people are going to land. You kind of touched on how the first three lifters, like the guys, came to you very very easily when you when you had to pick a team and you're struggling yep. for the fourth. I wanted to, that was, it's actually funny you mentioned that because that was one of my questions was how do you go about selecting your team? Is it uh, something that you pick strategically, like trying to pick lifters in certain weight classes, or is it purely on merit? Or I was going to ask experience, but clearly you know someone like Asher hasn't got that experience, so. Is there like a criteria? Is it like, uh, I guess, like what's the rationale? What's the, um, you know, logic behind mm. or, or the process even of, of putting together the best team you can for Apex? Yeah, there's a few elements to it because experience is one of them because um, there's not many athletes that I would put, very few athletes that I'd put into this competition who haven't competed before. Like that is, you know, it, it is a risk. And it's a risk, wrong, yeah, for sure. A hundred percent, it's a risk. Um, and like I said, he's the, he's the kind of guy who, who I think he's going to thrive under pressure, um, you know, where most people won't. Most I, I wouldn't. <laughs> I'd be, you know, I'd be nervous as shit going into this competition, uh, even though I've competed, you know, a dozen times. So, um, but, you know, I, I fucking panic in Call of Duty. Like. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yeah. it's one of those things. Uh, I'm a composed coach, but as an athlete, you know, I get nervous and most people do. Um, it's a normal human reaction. Um, where some people like thrive under pressure and Ash is one of them. Um, in terms of actually selecting the team, um, Tony Reinmuth obviously is, uh, he's a spectacle, you know, and he's a, an absolute lovely human being as well. It's, it makes it great. Um, but he, you know, he loves, he loves powerlifting. He's always been a part of it. 
for how many years? Probably longer than yourself, actually. Um, he, you know, is an absolute weapon. Uh, he recently squatted 402 kilos in sleeves, which is like the 13th biggest in the world. Um, if people didn't know, um, so he was Not definitely going to be part but... of that team, you know? Yeah. Um, in terms of Gabriel, um, he's got a little bit of experience now, but his recent competition, you know, totaled nine, uh, 692, um, did like a 430, uh, dots, uh, super competitive guy. Um, and so he was like, yeah, definitely a, a, a pick for me. And then, uh, Lotta was the obviously the final um, piece of the puzzle. Um, and kind of when that sort of came to me, I was like, because I was struggling with it, you know, where I was like, oh, like, you know, because there's elements there's no, of... Like, obvious choice, right? There's nothing, no one really... Yeah, there was, no, there was no obvious choice. And because you're right about weight classes, because obviously, and I didn't pick like Tony Reinmuth because I knew that he'd be I only mean, one of... Right. It doesn't matter who was going up against him. Like, I was like, he's an absolute weapon, you know? So it was like, Asher in the 110 class figured it wouldn't be as competitive in the 110 and it's and it's definitely not as much as the 190 and uh, 82 and a half um so well, I didn't really consider weight class when it, I looked at uh Tony Asher or even Gabriel I was just like these guys can put up a good total they can perform under pressure um and then a lot of come around at the 67 class and it's kind of funny that it's like, that's the most competitive class. And that's my last piece of the puzzle, which is kind of hilarious that people would be mm-hmm. looking for like your 52s and your, your 120 plus. And here I go. I'm like, yeah, let's go with the 67 and a half, the most competitive class. <laughs> yeah, that's um, how it went down. Um, but when I look at a team, you know, yeah, you look at, at some people who can perform under pressure. Um, obviously, they've had a history of, you know, um, putting up decent numbers um and also like i guess you could factor in injuries as well um someone who's super injury prone you may not or they may not be ready for this kind of competition um or they've just if they've had a recent you know niggle or whatever you'd probably avoid it um that's probably another variable as well with picking a team um i've obviously heard people talking about gender um in terms of you know being inclusive in that sense but this event is about putting together the best team you can. So for me, it's like, you know, weight doesn't matter what weight class is like, put your, your best lifters in. Um, and if that means putting them in a weight class that isn't as competitive, then that's, yeah, sure, go ahead. Like, because other people are going to be doing that as well. Um, so like, I'm not against, you know, changing weight class, for example, um, because it's one weight class is super competitive. It's like, ah, uh, look, we'll be better off going into this weight class. Um, because at the end of the day, this event is about winning and, you know, I'm going to do whatever it takes, um, to get those points. Yeah. I mean, like that's what the sports is about. And obviously you're a big sports fan and you understand that, that kind of element, you know, some people kind of get misconstrued and, and, you know, powerlifting, one of the reasons that we love it is because it's very inclusive sport because it's, it's very accessible. Anybody of any level can do it. And that's why we have novice comps. That's why we have, you know, local comps, but at this kind of event, what we want to try to do is raise the, the standard and say, cool, we have novice comps, everybody's included, we love that. But here, what matters is performing under pressure. And you kind of talked a bit about, you talked a bit about pressure, like about Asher and how he does well in the pressure. And this, you actually talked a little bit about this idea. And, you know, if you are your whole life just doing local comps, you never really have that pressure. And maybe you're a good lifter and you go to nationals, but you're like fifth. And Yes, there's a little bit of pressure there, but whether you come fourth or seventh, it doesn't really matter. Whereas at a comp like this, I feel like there's pressure not only from yourself because you want to do well, but like, yeah, you're representing the club and like finishing third or finishing sixth makes a big difference. Like that can be the difference between finishing third on the team result or fifth on the team result, for example. And so, um, you know, I never want someone to to feel so much pressure that they you know, collapse. But in the many ways, it's like that's the beauty of it. That's the that's what we're we're trying to manufacture it and give lifters that opportunity because lifters want that, you know, like if you're a competitive person, I'm sure you want that opportunity to, to go up against top lifters and, and fight out for something that's, that's meaningful. And that's, that's, um, that has a bit of prestige about it. Yeah. And uh, I'll, you know, I wanted to say this as well. I really appreciate you putting this on and also, cause I mean, it's probably 
I run events. I run for multiple federations. I understand it's a lot of work and it's hard and it's hard on me and, and it's hard on the team as well because obviously it takes a team to, to run an event. Um, it's hard on my partner. Um, but you've created an event. You've created rules. like So it's essentially kind of like a, a spin-off um, which you know, it's hard to also keep everyone happy when you create rules like that um, and create this like standard of competition. But you've put the work in for this where this is the most excited I've been for a competition. Like, and I'm obviously not even competing, um, but this is the most excited I've been because it, it's creating a new element of powerlifting where usually powerlifting obviously is very individual. Like your performance, you, you place here, you win this or whatever. And you can represent a club, sure, but it's very individual, right? It's not a... It's not so much a team sport. This is creating that level of team where someone and the athletes probably feel this, their their teammates are relying on them. So there's another level of pressure that people have never really felt. And especially when money's involved. Because forever in Natty powerlifting, there's been no money involved. So this is one of the first times, especially here in Victoria. Um, I'm sure around the world and they've had uh, competitions before with money, but this is probably one of the biggest competitions in regards to that. And it's not even really about the money, is it? I mean, you've mentioned this, that, um, you know, it's more about bragging rights than anything, right? And the team feel that and the athletes feel that. So that's probably why I'm super excited for it. But at the same token, some of my favorite competitions to coach at are novice competitions because everyone's so happy it's not vicious, um, you know, people are just bringing everyone up. There's no, like, there's less competitiveness to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, people I, I have such a good day and you live vicariously through them in that sense. So I, at Apex, like, we've been always been big on facilitating new people into the sport, never putting anyone down, you know, only bringing people up in the terms of doesn't matter what you total, like, enjoy competing, try to beat yourself, like, this is what it's all about. And then the other side of it, we've got this team event where we're like, this is about winning. Um, I'm going to put the best team I can forward um, and I'll, you know, work with the rules that you've set for this competition, as any coach should. Um, I think it's weird if people go, no, nah, I'm not about like, for example, um, this one's obviously been controversial, but a coach competing as part of the team. But I'm like, why would you have, a, that's part of the rules, you're allowed to do that. And if that means that's the best team possible, then go ahead. And and that'll be hard for the coach as well, by the way, to coach these three other people and compete on potentially the same time or even the same session as your uh, athletes. That's going to be tough for those coaches. Yeah, it's uh, it's. Um, I love what you said there about like uh, you know we're not elitists in the sense of we love novice comps, man. They're so fun, like you said, like they're some of the best days ever. But it is nice to have that kind of like. Uh, alternate i guess option and yeah it means a lot that you said like those words like honestly like it is a lot of work like you said and it takes a lot of my energy and a lot of you know a lot of creativity like coming up with different ideas and i'm sure you get this as well in business it's like sometimes you're lying in bed and you just have an idea you're like oh what about this and then i I can't sleep until i write it down or you're driving and you have this idea and you're like oh like i need to make sure i don't forget that because there's all these things that are flowing to you and then you do it takes research and like uh, there's a bit there's a bit of an iceberg effect, you know, you go to the meet and you see all the cool stuff that happens and you see the cool Instagram posts and all this stuff, but there's a sea of stuff that you don't see that just never made it. You know, maybe I had an idea, I Googled it, I called up, I got a quote, the guy came, ended up not working and I just wasted five hours on a project that never came to fruition. Those things are the things that are like more tiring. Like, yes, okay, filming podcasts and editing, it takes time, but everybody sees that, but there's all this other stuff that happens. And so, yeah, I mean, ever it's- since I became a meet, yeah, go. Yeah, oh, it's a lot of work. Yeah, like you're right. Um, people only see, yeah, the the end result um, and hopefully it's a successful in that sense. And there's a bunch of things that we try that aren't successful um, and people probably don't even see that. Um, there's just a lot of things that go on in the background and there's also a lot of people like no doubt Billy, who I dearly miss, by the way, um, you know, she probably does a lot for you as well in the club. And my partner, Brooke, does a lot um there's a lot of people involved you got all your coaches that do a lot of work um day to day even outside of even competitions you know so uh, and then you got your members who they volunteer to put their time forward to to help run a meet and you know it's this sport relies on volunteers it does um there's not enough money to pay wages that's just it's unrealistic at this point in time of course 
Um, but yeah, there's a lot of work that goes in and we all appreciate what you're doing because you've created this event that is, um, you know, that's the, I'm most excited I've been for a competition. Um, so at least it's all coming to fruition for you in that sense. Um, and it's super exciting. And, and you know, it's exciting because the, the athletes are super excited as well. They seem very motivated and I hear people talking, um, you know, and they will be talking about different athletes already about this event um, and who's going to win and who's competitive. And it, it is, uh, you don't see that often in powerlifting. Like a nationals can be coming up and no one will talk about it. The nationals will happen and the athletes will do that do their thing and you know there's sometimes there is surprises and someone has an off day and someone has a really good day but you don't really people don't really talk about it in 10 weeks earlier where for this event people are talking about it yeah i mean like that's why i'm <clears throat> on to do this podcast i'm trying to make this post and i'm trying to rile up conversation rile up discussion a bit of dialogue and whatnot and um yeah like i said i appreciate like what you have to say i mean when i first i mean you know when you coach lifters and you probably remember your first meet you know when lifters do their first meet, it's often quite transformative. Like a lot of lifters will do their first meet. They come off the platform with their last deadlift and they're like, that was the best day ever. And for me, that was like a really big uh, learning point of saying like, man, for people like for you and I, we're almost a bit desensitized. Like obviously we still love it. But we're a bit desensitized. You go to so many meets, you see so many lifts, it all becomes a big blur. Whereas for new people, for people that have done say less than five comps or less than three comps or none, for them, it's so exciting. And so one of my big goals is to make the event as powerful as possible as make it as moving as possible you know like I, I want i want people to have the best experience to say that was the best thing ever i want it to almost be like a roller coaster like you come off the roller coaster, roller coaster and be like that was a wave of emotion i want to do it again like that was so fun and so yeah it takes a lot of work but i but i really enjoy doing it because it's important like there needs to be these opportunities for people and, and i want to provide those opportunities in the meantime while we can't go to worlds or we don't have those types of opportunities just for now um yeah no, come back. A little yeah, I hope so. I want to ask you about yeah how you foresee the day going. We've got so many strong teams, and uh, you know some of the coaches I've spoken to already have talked about how they might they foresee that um, uh, a lot of teams might end up on the same score. So, for example, there might be you know last year if you look at the score sheet, there's a lot of teams it was on different scores. It was like eighteen points, seventeen points, sixteen points, five, fifteen points. I imagine there's going to be a lot of ties essentially, and it's going to go a lot more to the tie breaks. And so yep. you know you kind of talked about Tony being on his own, but I think Tony is actually going to be really I actually got a really strong feeling that Tony's results are going to be really important because if he totals mm. well enough, he could actually drag the average dots up. And I think average dots is actually going to play. Last year, it only broke one. It was only once used. It was to break the tie between second and third. Whereas every other placing, one through 13, was determined purely by placing, uh, by points. So dots, yep. average dots was essentially irrelevant. Whereas because yeah, there's you're... so many more teams, it's going to come down to tiebreakers a lot more, I think. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, like you're right. Um, this is going to be more competitive than it's ever been. I, I do have that feeling there's going to be a lot of teams within a point of each other. Um, you know, that it's, and it's actually something I probably hadn't even considered that, yeah, Tony, um, yes, he's by himself, but yeah, even on a very bad day, he'll, he'll dots like high 400s, which is insane, but that's just the level of weapon that he is. Um, and yeah, that's true. That, that is an advantage to the Apex team for sure. I mean, across the board, the, the, we've got the team, you know, they're all in the four mid 400s uh, and Tony being high 400. So it is a, a high um, dots point team. And I hadn't even really considered that because obviously I was just thinking about actually winning in terms of placement. But you're right in the sense that it's going to come down to within a point or tiebreakers. Um, I have that feeling. I don't think anyone's going to have a clear victory here um, where they just get like all four for it first. Like Victor last year, literally, uh, obviously did my homework and he got three first and a second. And the one mm -hmm. second he got, I'm pretty sure, was only by like two and a half kilos. So that in terms of the total difference. So I was like, he almost got four first. Um, so an absolute crazy team last year um you know and i think yeah he'll come back with a, a great team again um i think elemental of coming in with a really powerful team um there's obviously josh sim he's always around got a good decent team um obviously you guys jps everyone strength culture like everyone's got like right. you know solid solid teams uh and, and it will be decided by that a point here or there um particularly those um, deep weight classes, um, it will be decided by those as well. Um, and then you're right, Tony's uh, 
dots probably will come into play. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. I think the best element about this year is going to be just how, how deep the classes are with 22 teams, which makes the classes deeper. And kind of like you described about Tony, but, uh, you know, it's never fun. It's not that it's never fun, but it's, it's always better when there's more depth in the class. You know, when you're competing against five or six or seven lifters that are all within 10 or 15 kilos on the total where missing one squat can cost you first to fifth or something like that is just going to be so intense. I feel like it's going to be really, uh, yeah, it's going to be like a pressure cooker in there and I'm really looking forward to it. Tyler, I've really enjoyed this chat. Before I let you go, I want to ask for your definitive predictions. Who's taking first, second, third? And if you've done enough research, who might be best male lifter? Who might be best female lifter? Uh, ooh. Well, first, of course, Apex. So. <laughs> Excellent prediction. Of course. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, uh, for me, I just want to be competitive. Like, uh, if we don't come first, whatever. Um we're going into this to win for sure, but you know, I know this is a super competitive meet. Um, there's a lot of very strong teams in there and I'm just excited to be in the mix, to be honest, um, you know, and come in with the team. And obviously you mentioned Alex, um, uh, mentioned, uh, our team. And I did want, I did kind of want to come in as the underdog a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so it's, you know, particularly because obviously I've got two new athletes who no one would actually know. Um, mm-hmm. And it, and it wouldn't be until you do your research that obviously they're, you know, good athletes. Um, in terms of who I think is going to be up there, I definitely think Lou Lift or Victor will be up there in whether it's second or third. And then Elemental um, was probably my other prediction to be pretty competitive and take a second or third place. Excellent. I mean, like, I think those are pretty safe bets. Like Victor, like you said, had an awesome team last year. And there's a few repeat lifters again in his team this year. So you know that that's going to be, I wouldn't say a shoe in but like he's got a couple of wins potentially on the board already. Uh, yeah. The Elementals team is super strong. They've got Kulin competing the 110 against your Asher, actually. Uh, Tony Nguyen's mm-hmm. a super yeah. strong lifter. Um, and yeah, this class yeah. last year. Yeah, that's right. So th- those two teams for me uh, definitely stand out. Um, there's definitely going to be uh, teams that surprise me in the sense that, uh, oh, I didn't expect, you know, um, cause I haven't researched every team and every athlete. Um, I've got a, a business to run and dozens of clients, but, um, yeah, I think just from the surface level, looking at it, um, and definitely looking at the history of last year, uh, with Victor's team and then this year with, um, Elemental, especially with, uh, yeah, uh, Hung in the one tens, um, he's a, he's, a, he's an absolute weapon as well. Um. And if he has a good day, I don't think anyone's touching his numbers. Um, let's put it that way. Yeah, no doubt. Okay, mate. Um, look, we'll start, we'll call it there because we could ramble on forever. I think like I'm really we enjoying could. this conversation. But um, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Like you know, you're very busy, obviously running uh, running Apex coaching, all the stuff that you do. So I don't want to take up much more of your time. But Tyler, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for sharing your insights, talking to us a little bit about your excitement for the comp. You know, it warms my heart to hear how excited all the lifters are and the coaches are. And, you know, all the effort that's going into it behind the scenes, uh, you know, the the level that you're taking it, like the seriousness with which you're taking it. Yeah, it's really, really awesome to see. So thanks so much for your time, Tyler, and uh, I'll see you in a couple of months. All right. Thank you so much. And I'll see all the teams then.